Okay, hello and welcome to week 13 of the course. This is actually the, the last uh, big week with any like substantive content. We're nearly at the end, so that the last big topic is networking that I'll be doing today. Um, current attendance for the record is four, so that's the lowest ever. Hopefully that's more a reflection of COVID restrictions rather than everyone completely giving up. Um, on the plus side, at least it means we're not at risk of breaching the 50 person attendance limit that's been imposed. So, um, so thanks to the four of you for turning up so that I'm not lecturing to an empty room, which I would otherwise have to do because I'm still obligated to do it. Uh, so hello. Right, so we're going to talk about networking or network games. I wonder if we should maybe just close the door because there's a little bit of talk coming through. Let someone do that. Yeah. And can you maybe switch off the lower of the two lights? Because I, I tend to want the light to off the screen. Yeah, I think that's a little bit better, isn't it? Okay, thank you. All right, so networking is actually like a very big topic, of course. You could do entire courses in networking. Have any of you done that? Have any, do you do a course in networking at all? No? Um, so I've just got to compact the things that are relevant to games into just basically two lectures, I think. I'm going to get it covered in two, I hope. Um, so here's the basic problem statement for network games. You want to have more than one computer connected by some mechanism, a network, to provide a shared interactive, uh, preferably real-time simulation. We tend to care about real-time games in this, this course. Uh, and you want this to be applied to, at the limit, an arbitrary set of users who could be distributed anywhere in the world in the most extreme case. So that's the hard version of the problem. What is it? Uh, I don't know if you know the expression easy peasy lemon squeezy, but uh, it's sort of kind of like a, I think it's a British expression, uh, <clears throat> famously referred to in the, the film In the Loop. Have you seen In the Loop? Do you know this? It's coming up? Okay, it's just a stupid little clip. Why not? Might have to turn the speaker up again. Let's see if I can just turn the, uh, the volume up here. Now yeah, that would help. There's obviously someone who comes in here and turns the volume down. Right. This is kind of killing the joke here, but never mind. It's a film about the run up to the Iraq war, if you're interested. It's, it's good, funny. Yeah, so uh, networking and network games are difficult, difficult, lemon difficult. It's definitely one of the trickier things to, to make it work. Uh, so, why is that the case? Why is it difficult? Lots of problems. Uh, one thing about networks is they're intrinsically unreliable things. So computers themselves nowadays are, for the most part, reliable. You know, they, they execute the instructions faithfully. I mean, there can be bugs and stuff, but the machines are themselves essentially reliable. But networks are not reliable. As soon as you put a signal on a, a wire to send it a long distance, or you maybe even do it wirelessly as well, um, there are all sorts of sources of interference and error uh, that can cause them to be unreliable. And if you're writing a network program, you have to somehow uh, deal with that reality. Uh, so one thing is that when you send messages over a network, there's, not, there's no fundamental guarantee that they'll arrive, which is a, a big initial problem. Uh, you send things, and it just doesn't get to where it's going. Uh, networks also have limited capacity. There's only so much you can send, and often you might find in a game that uh, ideally there's like a, a huge amount of information that you might want to send, but in practice you get limited bandwidth, so you can't send all the data you would like. And now you have to think, well, how do I how do I work around that? 
Uh, sometimes your messages will have to be compressed. Right, fine. Uh, networks are slow. I'll come back to that. Uh, networks are hard to test. The other problem with networks is that a lot of these uh, deficiencies that they have are essentially random and unpredictable in nature. So we might test a scenario once and it works fine because the network was happy, but you try it again and the network's got different conditions, uh, different amount of packet drop, uh, different latency behavior, and it just, just being a different scenario. So the problem with networks is that it's very hard to reproduce things for testing purposes. This is a bit like the old uh, philosophical saying that you never step in the same river twice. You know, the, the world is always changing underneath you and networks are, are very much like that. Or even out of order. And sometimes messages arrive late. Or even out of order. Right, okay. They look at the, 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 the thing. I've put the thing before the other. Uh, when audience of four, it's hard to make the jokes work. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is networks are slow, right? Sometimes messages take a long time to get to where they're going, and uh, and some messages are slower than others, so things can actually arrive in a different order to the order they were sent. This is a classic thing that really happens in networks and is uh, not ideal for games. <clears throat> so why are networks unreliable? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, some of it's just like you know. Just reality of the world, like electrical noise on uh, on wires when you try and send a signal, it's prone to interference, thermal noise, or other forms of electrical noise. In fact, when I was a student, and we used to have like a because people didn't own their own computers back then in the early nineties, at least not everyone did. You would have like a computer lab. Do you still have computer labs where you have machines supplied for you? Oh, that's nice. Why why does anyone use them if you've all got laptops? Just to get better better machines. I have some software. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in, in the computer lab, uh, we used to have this uh, strange sense that the, the networking uh, in the lab would become very unreliable at certain times of day, and we began to think it correlated with the time of day where the cleaning uh, staff were out hoovering in the hallway outside, and that the electrical noise from the vacuums was actually causing interference, and possibly in not very well shielded network cables. don't know if it's true, but it's the kind of thing that, in theory, uh, could happen. Um, so that's one of the reasons it could be unreliable, just noise on the wire. Uh, you can also run out of bandwidth if you're trying to send too much. You know, the network just physically can't do it, so things have to get dropped, or worse, they can maybe collide with each other. Um, networks aren't just about the cables. There's interconnects, you know, switches and routers and stuff, and they are finite devices that have, you know, can only handle so much capacity. And again, if you just throw a lot at them, you can overload them. Um, for things to get from one place to another, they have to be routed. But it turns out that the routing can go wrong if the routing tables aren't up to date or get invalidated or some idiot at Facebook deletes the entire DNS record for their company, stuff like that, uh, which can cause problems. Uh, and then all these intermediate points between A and B, you know, all the machines that you go through and the routers and stuff, they can all just fail. You know, they're just devices. They crash. They, you know, they can run out of memory. They break. Um, so lots of things can go wrong with networks. Um, and if you go right down to the if you go right down to the wire level, networks are like extraordinarily difficult because you have to do this whole thing about if you look on an Ethernet or something, um, the way the Ethernet works is like a cable running through. You know, well, when it was wired Ethernet, a cable running through your machine that's got other people's data on it. And when you want to send a message, you have to kind of inject your data into the signal, but not on top of someone else's data. So there's a whole bunch of like coordination stuff has to go on there. But luckily. Ordinary programmers don't have to worry about that. That's done at the, the, you know, the the network card layer and the very low-level network drivers. Um, the actual programming that, that we tend to do operates at a much higher level than that through protocols that um, give you a slightly more cleaned-up version of the network. Where, for example, um, you know, you can just specify I want to send this message to a certain IP address. And you can kind of specify that at quite a high level, even though underneath the hood there's a lot involved in buffering and routing. But, but luckily, you don't. You have to know that it's happening, but you don't have to do it. Um, so this is what we actually do when you do networking. You you use various higher level protocols. Uh, so these are provided by your operating system or your uh, your general environment, um, and they make networking slightly less painful than it would otherwise be. But it's still painful. Uh, so one of the basic protocols is called UDP. Have you heard of UDP? No, not really? Interesting. Okay. 
So UDP is the user datagram protocol, and it's it's part of the basic uh, internet suite. So the, the internet protocol is called uh, TCP IP usually, and UDP is one of the kind of foundational parts of it, where it allows you to send like a small message from point A to point B. It's like a fundamental thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what UDP gives you is, as I say, the ability to say, I've got a, a certain amount of data, a couple of hundred bytes or something, and I want to send it to some other machine that's got an IP address, which is just a number that gets assigned by the system. And then it handles uh, actually making it into a proper packet and putting on the wire and wrapping it up in the right way so that when it reaches a router, the router has got some idea as to where to send it on to and it try and send it to your destination. Uh, that's sort of the idea. Uh, but UDP is pretty basic. It's kind of fairly low overhead and it's supposed to be a kind of fast way of sending things. It just takes the message that you want to send and wraps it up in a little uh, header like this with some extra information around it that wraps it up and then your data is in here and it just sends that as a message over the, the network uh, infrastructure. Uh, then there's another one which is a bit higher level than UDP called TCP. Uh, transmission control protocol, or you know, thermal tra transmission control protocol, uh, yeah, um, and it's uh, um, it adds some extra facilities on top of UDP that I'll maybe explain in a bit, and it has a slightly more complicated uh, structure to it. But it's basically the same idea. There's like a bunch of header information, and then some data that you're actually trying to send, and there's some stuff in here about sequence numbers and things that I'll explain in a bit. Um, so t TCP is not as trivial as UDP. UDP is basically a fire and forget thing. You just say, I want to send this message and you send it. And actually, UDP is not guaranteed. When you send a UDP message, the, the network will try to send it. But if something goes wrong and it gets corrupted or it gets you know lost on an intermediate router, it just doesn't get to where it's going. It's your job to check whether it got received. Uh, it doesn't have reliability built in. But TCP adds reliability to it. So it's got extra. So the idea is that the TCP, if part of your message gets kind of uh, lost on route or something, the the uh, the TCP protocol itself will detect that and will get get that part of the message to be resent to to kind of fill in the gap. Um, it also deals with the ordering problem. Like the TCP, if you send a bunch of packets, uh, they might not arrive in the order that you sent them, which is not ideal. Uh, but that's because they can go from different routes. Uh, but what happens with TCP is there's a sequence number is put on each part that you send, so the receiving end can look at the, 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 the numbers that it receives and it can shuffle them back into the originally intended order. So TCP is better than that respect. It's, it's reliable and it maintains uh, sequencing. Up to a point. It's not perfect. Obviously, if, uh, if you know some critical intermediate node and your, your network just fails and it can't be routed around, then your message won't get through and eventually you'll get a timeout. That's what sometimes happens if you try to contact you know, like a dead website or something. It will keep trying to do it, trying to patch up the errors that it thinks are happening. But if they keep happening because maybe that machine is just totally dead or it's an, an invalid address, eventually it'll realise nothing's getting through and it'll just give up and fail. But that usually takes quite a long time before it'll give up. Uh, so it can, it can work around small transient errors, but obviously it can't it can deal with like, you know, machines just being completely dead or something. Right, so both of those things, UDP and TCP, are part of the internet protocol. Um, so, I, I, so IP stands for internet protocol. I sometimes think of it as internet postcards, because my mental model of how all this works is that you're, you take your message uh, and you have, uh, messages have to be sent in kind of small packets over the internet, so your message is broken up into pieces. So I think of it as you've got like a big message and you break it down into individual like postcard size things, you know, that are quite small and you send them individually and each of them just goes out into the world and gets routed somehow. And then the recipient has to gather them all up and figure out which ones didn't arrive or anything else that happens. Um, at least that's the way the internet works now. This is called a, a packet switching where you take a message that you want to send and you break up into parts and you send each part and you just hope that they, they kind of get there. Um, the other way that it could have been done would be to be what's called circuit switched. A circuit switch network is one where when you say I want, you know, A wants to talk to B, what you do is you would establish an actual, a single path from A to B, and then you'd set that path up and preserve it, and then you would talk back and forth on that path until you both decided to disconnect. That's the way the, the phone system used to work. 
you know, even back in the day when there were operators, you know, you'd call up the operator and the operator would kind of plug through the connections from you to the, the a person at the other end. And now you'd have basically, you know, a joined up single wire that you were talking on and you kind of, like, you owned that wire while you had your, while you had your conversation. Um, so that would be a circuit switch network. But the internet, when they designed it, they decided they wanted to make it packet switched. Um, and there are kind of pros and cons between the two systems. But the idea about packet switching is you don't have to commandeer a whole line between you know, A and B. You don't have to preserve the whole line. You can just use whatever bandwidth is available at any given time. Uh, but that requires, that's why you have to split your thing up into packets, though, because you don't have a monopoly on the line. You just have a small kind of window where you can send your little bit. Uh, but the idea is when it's packet switched, it can then be sent by multiple routes. Uh, so it was a bit more flexible. Uh, I think this would just be the Wikipedia page about packet switching if you want to know a bit more about the theory behind that. But that's, uh, that's basically it. So what happens is you, you take the, like if you wanted to send like, a, like an image or something like that, you know, like a 20k image or something that you wanted to send uh, like on a web page, you know, when you're downloading an image from a web page, 20k is too big, that's bigger than a packet. A packet is usually something like, you know, 256 or 512 bytes or something like that, some unit that they've decided is convenient. Um, so your your image file gets kind of split up into packets of that smaller size. Uh, these packets are sometimes called datagrams or frames. They're just kind of basic, almost synonyms for the same idea. Just gets broken up into parts, and each part is sent individually and is individually addressed to who it's going to. So again, like a postcard, you know, everyone's individually got it sent, um, and that's basically how it works. Okay. Uh, and as I said, with UDP, that's really all that happens. So you just take the message, split it up into parts, you send them, and uh, it's in the lap of the gods as to whether they'll get to your destination and how long they'll take to get there. Um, it's a fire and forget kind of system. Um, and even if it arrives, it could potentially have been corrupted along the way. There's like a checksum system. So usually if a message gets corrupted, you can tell when you receive it that it doesn't look right. You know, the checksum doesn't add up. So you can kind of know that something's wrong. But in the first instance, it doesn't, it, you, you don't know what's wrong. So you, all you know is that it just uh, it got garbled. Um, and as I say, ordering isn't preserved. So these are all kind of quite annoying problems. Uh, the good thing about TCP is it numbers each postcard. You know, say like postcard one, postcard two, postcard three. And that way, when you receive them in the order two, three, one, the receive buffer kind of realizes that and shuffles it. And the application doesn't see any of this. The, the, the driver uh, is doing the reordering and a buffer at the receiving side. And when the app reads the data, it will read out one, two, and three in that order because it's been, you know, it's been done for you. Uh, so which of these two protocols should you use? The UDP one that is uh, totally unreliable. You don't know what order things are going to come in. You don't know if they're going to come at all. Or do you use TCP, the one where they actually arrive sensibly in order, reliably, get resent if they get, uh, if they're not transmitted properly? What do you think? You're in TCP, okay? Anybody else? You're in TCP, right, okay. Well, <laughs> um, it turns out it's not quite so easy, right? Uh, you might assume that, I mean, it sounds like TCP is a good thing, but it builds this reliability layer, and you think, well, I want that, um, so why don't you always adopt it? The problem is that it comes at a cost. The, the reliability that TCP builds is done by having systems underneath you that are doing things like saying, hmm, packet two doesn't seem to have arrived yet. Okay, that's a bit suspicious. And then eventually it will say, okay, it didn't arrive. It's probably lost. I'll send a message saying, could you please resend packet number two? And it goes to the other side and it says, okay, well, I'll send two again. But the problem is that it stalls when it's doing that. So uh, it won't, um, kind of depends. The details are a bit complicated, but you can get into a situation where it's uh, waiting to resend two and it won't send three, four, or five until it kind of clears the, the bag, the log jam. The problem is this, this just costs, right? It costs particularly time, but also it costs memory as well because the reordering requires you to have buffers at the other end so that things can be sorted before they get passed up to the application. There's just a bunch of complexity there. Um, the, the basic problem with TCP is that the reliability mechanism increases latency. It means that when a packet gets dropped, you have this kind of like extra round trip delay while they negotiate with each other and say, oh, no, wait a minute, you didn't send this. Can you send this one again? Is like, I did send it. Oh, no, I didn't send it. Eventually it, it converges. But the problem is that can sometimes take a long time. And one of the problems with like real time games is, you know, late information is almost not worth having. 
you know, you don't, you know, if you're playing like a 60 hertz game, um, imagine that you drop a packet halfway through, like a, you know, a little positional update gets lost. The TCP, it will kind of realize, oh no, I've lost something, and it will go through, it'll jump through all these hoops to get that resolved, and then it'll eventually get you that piece of information. But maybe it, you get it a second later. So a, sec, a second later, I don't want it anymore. I'd, I'd rather you had just, you know, just ignored it. Uh, so the thing is, sometimes games they don't want reliability if it comes at the expense of latency, because latency is, is even, you know, latency is like the worst thing. So sometimes games actually use UDP, accepting that occasionally a packet might get lost, and the app just deals with that because it might be that you send updates like, you know, 30 times a second or something, and if one of them doesn't arrive, just that uh, doesn't another one will be long in a second or, or long in a fraction of a second. So, so it turns out it depends on what you're doing. And a lot of uh, kind of real-time games, you know, kind of FPS shooter games, they'll actually use UDP because they don't want the they don't want the glitching and the hitching that would occur if TCP was trying to replace the lost packets. They just design the game to deal with that instead. So they actually use UDP even though it's less reliable. Uh, so that's the, uh, the story there. But it's not always the case. Some games use uh, some games do use TCP and some games use a mixture of both. Uh, and other uh, other games sometimes they they build their own custom reliable UDP thing. So they actually send UDP, but they do the reliability <coughs> mechanism in a way that is, a, is kind of a convenient for games, you know, they, where it, it does, uh, sometimes it will, for example, just it will send everything twice instead of doing the resend mechanism uh, as a kind of dumb way of making things reliable. So there's all sorts of tricks to get done. Um, so this whole late thing is, is really becomes the big question because in a network game, you're trying to create the illusion uh, of a shared environment where this, everything is happening at once to all the participants, right? Um, and latency totally breaks that. Now, you'll know this if you've played network games, you know, if you're playing a game that's got lag in it, as players tend to call it. Lag can mean lots of things. Lag could be like slow, uh, slow CPU operations and stuff, things like that, but it does include network latency as well. So the problem is, of course, you play a network game and, you know, you... You, you know, you jump or something, and it doesn't it, it doesn't happen until half a second later because you've had to wait for a network acknowledgement of your action, or you shoot and you think you killed the guy, but you haven't killed the guy because he isn't where you thought he was because of a because you've got a, a kind of out of date version of his position. So latency is uh, is really horrible. Uh, but latency is also a fact. It's just like a physical fact. Uh, you know, the speed of light is the best we can do. And real networks can't actually approach speed of light level transmissions. And even if they could, it turns out the world is just big enough that even if you had the best possible network, you'd still have to have uh, at least tens and potentially like 100 milliseconds of delay to send messages like halfway around the world and stuff. Um, and unfortunately, that's, you know, for a lot of purposes, like 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second is not a lot of time for, for many things like compared to ordinary you know, the ordinary kind of human activities, it's not a lot, but you compare it to the speed of the frame rate of a game, where you're trying to knock off a frame every 16 milliseconds, then, yeah, 100 milliseconds of latency is horrible. That's six frames, so it's really bad. Uh, okay. Uh, so the speed of light is the theoretical limit on how, how, how long it takes to send messages from uh, anywhere to anywhere else. And even if you could achieve that perfect limit, ignoring things like uh, routing delays and switching delays, which you also get in reality, we could uh, we could try and work out some theoretical minimum values here. So if you take the US and you take a city like uh, Berkeley in California, which is on the west coast, and you imagine sending a message to Boston, uh, Massachusetts, on the east coast, uh, what's like the lowest possible uh, latency you could get for that? Well, roughly speaking. The distance between those two places is about 5,000 kilometers. The speed of light in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters a second. It turns out that the actual speed of transmission lines, whether it's copper wire or even optic fiber, uh, doesn't reach the full speed of light. It's usually about two-thirds, apparently. So in reality, your speed is a bit more like 2 times 10 to the 8. So you just go and work this out, take the distance divided by the, the speed, and the time ends up being something like 25 milliseconds is like the shortest possible time you could take to send a message between those two points. Uh, and of course, often what we care about is the round trip time, you know, the time to send a message and get the reply from it. So the best you can do there is 50 milliseconds, which is still several frames worth of time. It's, it's a fair amount. 
Um, and that's, that's the best case. In reality, you've got intermediate stages, you know, routers that are buffering it and having to think about where to send the message next, and that will take time, there's processing time, uh, you know, we're going to get occasional hiccups and things. It might not be taking the optimal route, you know, it might not be a perfect straight line path, it might have to take like a zigzag path. Um, so you include all those sort of effects, and I would say you would expect maybe 70 milliseconds or something to be a, a what we call a ping time, like a round trip time. Uh, within the US. And in fact, if you can look, you know, some online resources that try and track this, they actually try and uh, measure uh, ping times between various places in the world. Uh, you can see here we've got a couple of things that you can cross reference. Uh, it turns out there's one in here that, where they actually have a San Francisco to Boston, which is close enough for their West Coast to East Coast example. And uh, if you go and look there, you'll see that actually, and I really did, this was, this was a, an intelligent an intelligent guess on my part, based on the on theory. And uh, when I went and looked at the real numbers, uh, it was uh, pretty close to the reality that it's about 70 milliseconds to do the, with occasional uh, horrible spikes when things go terribly wrong. Uh, so you get an idea. You know, it's it's kind of there is indeed variability, as I've been saying. Uh, you can see there's a standard deviation stuff on here, um, and this is sort of how long it takes to send messages. So it's long enough that it's a problem. And that's just that's just what the basic ideal of sending a message between two computers. In reality, there can be more you need to do than that. Sometimes, for example, with TCP uh, or when setting up a sockets, generally there's like a handshake process at the start where the two machines have to sort of uh, agree to talk to each other. So the flow is often that you send some kind of initializing message. So that's the source and the destination somewhere else in the world. You go through you know some switches or routers or something that are intermediates. Uh, so you send the message to them. Uh, this time is going down the way here, by the way. So across is like some notion of of distance in space, kind of stylized, and down the way is time. Uh, network diagrams are often drawn like this. Uh, so you send a message. It takes a bit of time to get to the router, plus or minus some processing time maybe, and it goes to the other router, and eventually gets to the destination, and it sends a, re a re receipt, which is often like a handshaking thing, saying, I'm ready to send the data. OK, we're playing. Uh, and then eventually you can actually send real data. So you send a bunch of real data and you maybe wait for it to be acknowledged. So the point is, it actually ends up taking a fair amount of you know back and forth, like you know one, two, three, maybe four kind of message cycles before you get, get any useful work done as well. Um, so th this is not great, but it's it's tolerable for simple cases. Uh, there are such things like uh, you know you take like a turn-based game, like if you're playing chess with someone in another part of the world, not very latency sensitive. So it doesn't matter that you know when you type in your move, it takes you know a fraction of a second to reach the other computer. It's like it's okay. It took you longer than that to think of the move. <coughs> so it doesn't matter. Um, so chess is kind of a, an easy one for network games in that there isn't a lot of data to send. You know the moves in chess can be described very briefly, so it's not a bandwidth hog. It doesn't really depend. It, it's not latency sensitive, so the fact that it takes time doesn't really matter. Uh, so that's an easy case. Um, there are other kind of semi-easy cases, like if you're even if you're playing like an action game, if you're playing over a local area network where all the machines are like you know together in the same room, like like an office game, you know a bunch of people in the office are playing Quake or something. Um, that's not so bad because the connections are so immediate that the messages basically arrive instantly and fairly reliably as well. So LAN games work quite well. And again, back in the day, this is what you did: you played LAN games because internet games were like horrible. Uh, because the the latencies were even worse when you were on like, modems and stuff like this, right? Um, so there are some games that are latency tolerant, and you could play chess over the internet in the 90s, and it didn't matter. Um, but if you wanted to play an action game, you could play it on a local area network, but you couldn't, you know, if you tried to play it on the internet, it wouldn't work very well. Um, because the the difficult case, uh, the difficult, difficult, lemon difficult case, is uh, when you're dealing with real time twitchy games where you really want instant instant response to your actions because you can move very quickly or you're shooting and people are running quickly and you're trying to deal with internet latency. So that's the tricky thing. Um, the other question that comes up if you're doing a network game is what exactly do you send over the network? Uh, you know, Because you're trying to create this, this illusion of a shared experience that people are having everywhere. So you have to coordinate, you have to send something. But what do you actually send? In fact, I mean, any suggestions? What 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 data would you send over the network to make an internet game work? Like if you're doing, you know, Quake or something. What, what do you send? Locations. Location. So the locations of the players and things like that. So maybe each player would send its location. Any other ideas? 
What's that? Some actions. Actions like, you know, he's jumping or shooting, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, so those are reasonable. Um, so there's a bunch of answers you could, in fact, give to that. So one is you could send the, the raw key presses to begin with. You know, if somebody, you know, press WSAD, send the key press to the other machines so they, they know what you did, and then each machine would process the consequences of the, of the key presses. That's one way you could do it. Or you could send logical actions. So rather than literal key presses, which maybe depend on what your key bindings are, you wouldn't send like you wouldn't send W, you would send up. You know, that way it doesn't matter whether they're using a mouse or a keyboard or they've redefined their keys. So you would send the idea of this guy pressed up and the other machines would know that and would process it accordingly, maybe. But that means that if you do that, every machine has to do all the work. You know, they have to process the logic of moving all the characters. And that might end up being too slow if you have a lot of characters. So something's what's in fact done is you send states. So that's more like sending positions. Uh, also, velocities you often send because if you send a velocity, you can kind of work out what things are doing in between. You know, you send an update and you say, "Well, he's here, and this is his velocity." And if you know that, it means you can kind of predict where he would go while you're waiting for the next message to arrive. And the next message comes in and sort of slightly corrects things, and you kind of you, you sort of extrapolate between the messages. So states as commonly sent a lot of games kind of do that um, but if you're going to send states the other thing you can do is instead of just sending the state which is like the position you send the difference from one position to the next the reason for so they're called deltas uh, the reason for that is that the deltas um, often compress better like instead of just uh, saying you know here's the xyz coordinates of this guy you say here's how different they are from the last time i sent them and those tend to be smaller numbers. In fact, sometimes it's going to be zero. And if you have a compression system, you can write it so that it's good at compressing small values. Uh, so often you send deltas. Uh, another thing you could theoretically send is you could just render like the image uh, that the player is supposed to see, and you could send the picture to them, right? But that's kind of a bit dumb, right? Because you'd have to take the cost of rendering the image, and you'd have to send that image, which is quite, you know, an image takes a lot more data than sending key presses, right? So you wouldn't normally choose to send the images around the network. Uh, the reason I mentioned it, though, is that uh, some people apparently think that this is how network games work, that they actually send, you know, that they send like a video stream uh, to each player, but they don't usually. Usually they just send things like state information, and then each machine independently renders the thing from its own point of view, obviously. <clears throat> so having decided or at least speculated about what to send, there's also the question of how to send it. Um, you don't usually have much choice over this. Like, uh, you know, it, it depends on what type of network you're playing on. You basically have to send it using the available network uh, resources. But sometimes there's choice as to what those might be. Uh, for example, in the early days of network gaming, what you did is you sent over a cable, uh, a direct cable between the two machines. Uh, this was for in the very simple network games or two-player games. What you did is you could actually take like a printer cable or a thing called a null modem cable, and you would just take the two computers and just connect them together, and the message got, just gets sent on a like a meter-long cable. And that was a network game. You both had to be in the same room and everything, but it did mean you each were playing on your own machine. I used to do this with my uh, my friend back when I was a teenager. This, this a network game involved. You wanted to play a network game with your friend. You didn't just like log on to Steam and see what they were doing on Discord or something. Uh, what you did is you took your computer, your home computer, and a cable, and a portable television set, which was, remember was a cathode ray tube as well, so it was like yay big, right? a box, and and you walk to his house, <laughs> and you put your TV next to his TV, and you put in, you put a cable between the computer, and said, let's play a network game now. That was that was how you actually used to do it. Um, and in theory, you could do the same thing now with wireless. You know, like I think you get games like uh, phone games where you can play them, and you just do it over like Bluetooth or wireless. So again, you know, just direct. Uh, direct, fairly direct linking. Um, then you can use LANs, of course. A lot of games play on a LAN. The advantage there being that, again, the machines are also close together, that the latencies are low, uh, and the network is going to be fairly reliable, so that's good. Um, or you can go up to like a campus network, just the same, only a bit, a bit more extended. And then for finally, wide area networks, as they're called, which includes things like the internet, which are pretty dispersed. Um, the other thing about networks is that you have to sometimes be aware of how the machines on a network are actually physically connected to each other. Um, there are a bunch of ways of doing it. These are called topologies. 
So, for example, like a ring topology, each machine is just connected to one neighbor in a circle. This is how Ethernet used to work, incidentally. It doesn't, not so much nowadays, because you often have a, a central router, central, central switches used on Ethernet now. But in the early days of Ethernet, if you were wiring up your office, this is the way you did it. That each machine had, was connected to one guy on the left and one guy on the right, and the cable just kind of ran through them to create a ring. So that then meant if this machine wanted to send a message to this machine, what it does is it puts it on the wire and actually gets passed around to each machine. But it's just that it has got information on it saying who it's addressed to. So only the guy it was addressed to was supposed to take it off and look at it. But of course, if you install the packet sniffer uh, in here, you could read messages that were intended for other people and uh, and spy on the network, which used to be possible. Um, there, but there are lots of other ways of doing it, like a star network, where everybody sends something to a central hub and it does and it, like a switch and it will then decide who to vector it to that way. If you send from him to him, it goes through the intermediate, but these three guys don't get to see it, so they can't uh, spy on it. Um, a fully connected one is where everyone's connected to everyone else, but that very quickly becomes cumbersome. You get lots of wires, lots of connections. I mean, the connect it means that you know the connection paths are as direct as they could possibly be, which is kind of good, but it doesn't scale very well. As soon as you get a lot of machines, this becomes unwieldy. Um, Right, which takes you to the internet. Uh, so the, the internet is, um, the, you know, literally the internet means a, a network of networks. Uh, the original idea with the internet was that um, a bunch of universities had these kind of small lands uh, or whatever they had on, on, on their own sites, and they just wanted to connect them all together. So there was some way of saying, okay, we'll take these lo lo local networks and we'll find a way to let them get messages outside of their network into this kind of broader thing where it would then go through the backbone and come back into somebody else's network. So just a network of networks. Um, this is like a, an old, very out of date now, but a kind of stylized map of the internet, just showing the idea that there are, there are kind of lots of, you know, kind of hubs and spokes, if you like. There are like kind of key locations uh, that radiate out to like, you know, local areas. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of kind of wiring in between the main hubs and so on. If you zoom in on any part of this, you would get some kind of hub and, and the kind of spokes that come off it. So this is just like a, you know, a big node, and these are the things that are connected to that node. Sort of how it works. Uh, right. So we'll go back to um, one of the kind of simpler types of uh, networking arrangement you can have. So this is the this was a game that allowed you to play networking with two machines connected together with a wire. So this is the one I used to play when I was a uh, a teenager. Um, it's called Stunt Car Racer. And it was great in its day. Um, My job is to make college easier because students have a lot of um, so, so this is like from the late 80s or something like that. And it's just a driving around an elevated 3D track. Um, this was actually quite early for 3D as well. Um, it was impressive that this wasn't just 3D, it was fill 3D. You know, a lot of people were beginning to do like wireframe graphics, but this has got fill 3D. It's very impressive. And you drive around in the car, around this uh, circuit, and you jump over things. And uh, I think the menu screen maybe proves that there is indeed a multiplayer option. There you go, it's got a multiplayer option, which this is just a single player demo, but this is kind of how it works. So you would select multiplayer here, and the idea was that uh, you would then uh, wire up your computer to, to your, your friend's computer. And you'd both be able to get your own screen, and you were both driving on the track, and you could see each other. Look on your screen, you could see the other guy. So it did work, um, even though you had to cart your machine around to do it. Um, so I don't know exactly how it worked, but I would assume that the way it worked was that it would send your basically just send your control inputs to each machine. You know, so that all happens when you press the key locally, it would send that to the cable to the other machine, and then that way his computer would know what you'd done and you knew what he had done, and you would both just compute the consequences of that. So it's a bit like, it, you know, almost a bit like the two players were both on the same keyboard. You know, he wasn't really, but you sent the information, so he could then, the computer could then imagine that he'd pressed his keys and you'd press your keys, and you'd compute what would happen, and that's how it worked. Um, but in order for this to work, you do need your game logic to be deterministic, because what you're relying on is that both computers uh, are going to compute the exact same future state as each other, so that means that the game logic needs to be deterministic, which means that they both... Well, what other thing does that mean that the machines have to keep in sync so that they'll uh, produce consistent results? Um, the DUs, right. So the, the delta time values have to be the same on both machines so they don't diverge. 
Um, so you had to kind of lock frame rate. But the thing is, you could do that because the game was designed for a particular machine, like a, an Atari ST or something. So they both had exactly the same processor running at the same speed. So you could say that, yeah, they're both going to run at 30 FPS. So you could just lock them down. So they'd use the same uh, delta time values. They both have access to the same inputs because you had arranged that over the wire. And if you do that, they'll both produce the same future states. And that's how they remain in sync. Uh, so that's the kind of simplest way to do it. Um, then a few years later, it became possible to do other things. When I started working uh, back in Scotland in the, the mid to late 90s, uh, when, we were, when we were making GTA, in fact, uh, one of the games that we would play at lunchtime well, was a, another racing game called Big Red Racing, and it looked a bit like this. It had this weird, deliberately crude style to it. I think because the because uh, again, early days of 3D, they couldn't. This was like one of the very earliest uh, DirectX games. Um, software rendering uh, and maybe supported hardware, but you didn't have a lot of hardware rendering back then. So this is like rendered in software, low poly counts. So it kind of went for a deliberately crude style, I think. Um, just jump into the actual game. <laughs> So very crude by today's standards. It was actually quite a fun game though, uh, and the idea here is you could play this over a LAN. So this wasn't just two people with a cable. This was the whole office. You know, six people in an office were playing it, um, and that was like a big step up. That was a uh, 1996 or something, I think. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so the interesting thing about Big Red Racing is it used a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology. So the idea with that is that each machine uh, would send information about what it was doing to every other machine on the network. So you had, like, let's say you had six players playing it. Each one of those six players would work at what it was doing locally and then would send state updates to the other five machines so that everyone got to know what everyone was doing in a kind of loose way. Um, so uh, I think with Big Red Racing, what we, we inferred is that it, was, it wasn't sending key presses, we don't think, because the way it worked, it, but it would, what it would do is it would, it would locally calculate the physics for that person's car, and then it would send the position and the velocity of their car to the other players. That way, each machine only had to compute the actual physics simulation for one car, and the others just told it where they were. So it's like your suggestion that they, they send states. So the states would all arrive, so you could see the other players moving about, and you would move as well. And there were things you could see that... The other players didn't move as smoothly as you did because maybe you know you're running locally at you know 30 frames a second or something, and maybe the network updates are only coming in at 10 frames a second. So you could see that the other cars would move a bit more jerkily than you would, and that was probably what was going on. There were also things like interpolation, so that uh, as I say, you could send the velocities, so you would see the other person's car and he knows velocity, and he would basically just keep traveling at constant velocity until another network message arrived and maybe corrected his position a bit. And one of the big giveaways that that's what was happening was if, uh, if somebody crashed, like the computer crashed, the program crashed in the middle of the, not the car crashed, uh, if the program crashed, you would actually see their car would just fly off into space because it just kept going at the velocity it had and there were, there were no more network messages arriving, so it would just keep going. So that's one of the downsides of this approach, that uh, if you're just sending all these messages that uh, you could potentially have invalid states because you were just having to guess where the other people were. Um, and that did cause real problems with Big Red Racing. Uh, so this was an attempt to do like a distributed simulation in that each machine would be computing part of what was going on, like computing its own physics, and you would try and just make them all share the information between each other. But it does cause problems, and although it was a fun game, one of the problems with it, as I say, you could have this thing where cars would fly off into the distance when they crashed, which is weird, but also... Um, Sometimes things would fly for a bit, and then eventually a, a network message would arrive to correct their position, and they'd suddenly jump to a new location because you know the, the velocity hadn't been quite right. They'd you know they'd done they'd, you know they'd collided with something or they'd turned heavily, and you would suddenly see the cars jumping. And of course, you know this from network games. You get these kind of nasty corrections where people just hop about from time to time, and that's what's going on. Uh, so that could be annoying. The worst thing with big red racing was. That this could even mean that you get divergent outcomes. That we noticed after playing it for a while that sometimes you would, you know, you would literally win the race and think you'd won. It would say you'd won, and so would someone else, <laughs> because each machine was locally deciding who won. 
and there was always a slight local advantage because your local machine had no latency, basically. Uh, so, you know, it was you against all the slightly delayed versions of your opponents. So it was really, I mean, it was, you know, that was kind of frustrating that you would realise at the end that it, because they had, they had not been totally in sync with each other, they couldn't even agree who had won the race, which was a little bit weird. Um, and this is one of the reasons why peer-to-peer like, -peer networking uh, topologies can be a problem. It can be hard to make them be uh, consistent. Um, so there are a couple of ways to try and stop getting the divergences that happen in a peer-to-peer -peer game. One approach for doing it is that you have to force everyone to be in sync. You have to stop this thing where you know, your local player has got a, a zero latency advantage. Um, so what you have to do instead is you say, no, I have to wait until everyone has sent me their, their data before I can update the frame. And that way it makes it fair. You know, no one has an advantage over anyone else. Uh, so that's called lockstep, where you just force everyone to uh, force all the inputs for a given frame to arrive and then be processed. Um, so each machine has to wait for all the other machines to take their turn before you do the computation. And if you do that, you can keep them in sync. So that's good. But it does mean that each machine has to wait for all the others to send their data. And that's bad because that takes time and it slows everything down, right? So it increases latency. Um, and in fact, the annoying thing is it's weakest link latency. Because if you have to wait for all the other players to send you their state before you do the next thing, you know, it's like you know, it's like forcing everyone to declare their move in a board game or something. And then so once everyone's declared their move, you execute it. But that means you have to wait for the slowest player to decide what to do. And uh, that's bad in itself, but it's also particularly bad if that slowest player has crashed. Because if they've crashed, they're never going to send you anything. And it means that if one person crashes, the whole game kind of freezes until you eventually eject the guy, realising that he's dead. So that's kind of annoying. Um, you can do this, so you can do this to a small scale. Like if you get a small number of players, you can use lockstep to, be, to get the reliability. Um, but if you try to scale it any higher than that, you would start to have all these weakest link problems. So it's not so good. Um, there's another approach you can use to try and deal with this. Uh, this is actually something I, I kind of came up with uh, for a game that I worked on, although I presume other people have thought of it too. And that's where you take the, your local inputs and you kind of uh, you put them in a slight delay buffer, which you, you basically um, you, you simulate the latency of the network uh, locally. Uh, that way, um, everyone experiences the same apparent latency and everything, again, is fair but you do it without waiting for other people. You just do it by delaying your own inputs in a buffer. It's quite a strange idea. Um, so what you can do is, uh, if you know that you're on a network that's got like 10 milliseconds of latency, which is to say, if you, send your key, you know, if you send your key presses to the other guy, he'll get them in 10 milliseconds from now. Well, if you put them in a local buffer that also takes 10 milliseconds before you bounce them back to yourself, then you get your own inputs in 10 milliseconds, and he gets your inputs in 10 milliseconds, and the same works symmetrically. So actually, everyone processes, receives the inputs at the same time. Um, so you're kind of in lockstep, but you didn't have to wait for anyone. You, actually, you only had to wait for yourself. Uh, so what happens is you just you just put a little bit of deliberate local delay, and that way you don't have to wait for the network. It's subtle, but you can sort of make it work. Um, so in fact, a game that I worked on called Crackdown worked this way. Uh, it was it had to support networking with a small number of players. Was it maybe just two? I'm not sure if we could do more than two. Um, small number of players, and we had very little bandwidth to use because this was back in like, the olden days when people were still on modems, so you couldn't send a lot of data. Uh, and this approach means that all you had to send was to basically the key presses um, and have a little bit of a local look-back buffer, and it, it kind of worked okay. Um, okay, so that's... Uh, yeah, that is indeed a reasonable place to stop, and I'll, uh, I'll just start up with the next part shortly.